Hello, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. Just give it a second to confirm that everything's working. So I am feeling pretty proud right now. I think my technology is actually working. I didn't have any issues this time. And for any of you who have been following our live streams, you may know that I've had technical issues every time I've tried to do a live stream. So I'm super excited. And for anyone who hasn't caught our live streams before, or maybe just hasn't caught one that I've done, my name is Monica and I am a policy manager with Whale and Dolphin Conservation. Our office in North America is based out of Plymouth, Massachusetts. So I am sitting not in our office today, but still working from home and um, not, I'm not too far from the office, but sitting here in Massachusetts. And um, I know we have people who watch from across the country, maybe in other countries as well. So if you are listening to this, I'd love for you to let me know where you're watching from. So feel free to drop that in the comments and we'll see where everybody's from. Some of what I'm going to talk about today is sort of specific to this area out here in the Northeast, you know, the New England area where I am. Um, but I will make references to where there might be additional resources available for other regions as we go along. So depending on where you are, uh, this may be about the time of year where like here in Massachusetts, a lot of people are starting to get their boats out in the water. The weather is getting nicer. Today is a beautiful day here. So hopefully everyone else is having good weather as well. So there are a few things that are helpful to keep in mind when it comes to heading out on the water in search of whales. And so right now there are still restrictions in a lot of states about what kind of activities you can take on that involve large gatherings. So I'm sure there are a lot of people who are taking out smaller boats right now to get on the water maybe just with some friends or family. So this is for you. <laughs> and if you're heading out on the water, particularly in search of whales, I'm here to help you with that today. And I will have an emphasis on how to watch, how to safely watch whales. And obviously working for whale and dolphin conservation, the safety and well-being of whales is a top priority for us. But one of the other main reasons why we talk about this and the safety aspect is because there really is a big human safety component to it as well. So I will be talking about this from both perspectives, also keeping in mind the welfare of the animals, but also your own well-being out on the water. And there are certain steps that you can take to ensure that. So to that end, obviously boats come in all different shapes and sizes, variations, different styles and types. But again, if we're talking about smaller vessels, like might be more common to be heading out on the water right now. I just picked an average size of about 31 feet. So the boat I have pictured here is a 31 foot boat. And depending on what kind of whales you might have in your area, there's a pretty good chance that those whales will actually be larger than your boat. So here I have an illustration of a humpback whale. And this is one of the types of whales that can be seen pretty much in all of the world's oceans. They are what we call cosmopolitan. So they are pretty much found everywhere. So they're kind of a good example for this purpose. Other whale species are smaller, but a lot of them are actually even larger than this. So again, depending on the size of your boat, there is a good chance that the whales that you're trying to watch are actually larger than your boat. So if you think about your boat being a moving object and a whale being a moving animal, if the two collide, that can cause a lot of damage and also a lot of injury as well for both sides of it. So again, all of this that we're doing today that I'm covering today is keeping in mind everybody's safety and just being conscious of the fact that there are whales that are out there that are probably larger than your boat. And so that's something you wanna keep in mind. Now, there's actually quite a bit of work that you can do actually before you head out on the water. And I won't call it homework because nobody likes to do homework, but it's kind of along those lines. Knowledge is power. So. There's a lot that um, it's, it's helpful to be aware of before you head out. So all of the information that I'm gonna share with you today is based off of a program that WDC runs um, with our partners at NOAA Fisheries. And that program is called Sea Spout Watch Out. And it's meant to provide these helpful tips for you so that you can 
kind of like a, a cliff notes version of, of the uh, quote unquote homework that we're asking you to do. But it's just trying to make all this information as concise as possible. And so kind of think of it as one stop shopping. So you head to our website at csbout.org. You'll find a lot more information about everything that I'm bringing up today. One of the things that is good to be aware of is the species in your area. And so again, there's a lot of different animals out there and they can be very hard to find, but when you do find them, it's helpful to try to be able to figure out what species of whale you're looking at. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them being that these different species behave differently. And so if you're able to identify what kind of whale you're watching out on the water, you might be able to predict some of their behaviors. And if you're operating a boat, that's gonna be helpful for you to know maybe how wide you need to stay away from the whale. Um, there are mostly whale watching guidelines in place, but in some areas there are also regulations that are enforceable that you have to follow that aren't just recommended. So it's really important to be able to identify those species as well. So as much as you can learn about the species that you could potentially see in your area. And again, because I'm based here in Massachusetts, we typically see North Atlantic right whales during certain times of the year, usually in the spring. Although I think most of them have pretty much left our area for right now for more Northern waters. But they are one of the most well-studied whale populations in this area, and they are also endangered. So we really put a lot of effort into trying to track their movements. And so there is actually a website that everybody can access um, that will bring you to a map that looks like this. And on this map, hopefully you can see there's a bunch of small black whale tail icons. And those are all areas where right whales have been seen recently over here on the right side. You can see I have a set, um, set of dates here for my search. And so what we're seeing here is off the coast of Southern Massachusetts from the period of April 1st through May 23rd. So these are all the right whales that were seen in that time. So in my case, if I was about to get on a boat and leave out of Plymouth Harbor, that yellow star there is where Plymouth is, this would be really helpful for me to look at because hopefully you can see just to the right of that star out through our harbor, there were a couple of right whale sightings here recently. And so this doesn't necessarily guide me to whales that I want to go and spend time watching. So you actually can't legally get closer than 500 yards, the right whales in US waters. So even if I came across a whale, I would have to stay back. But the reason that this is helpful for me is because I might be a little bit more aware when I'm traveling through those areas that there is the potential that those whales could still be there. This isn't quite real time, but it's pretty close and it's updated regularly. So again, this would definitely help me to know if I have whales nearby. And down in the, the bottom right here, um, the easiest way to find this map and to go in and search for whatever dates and what area, whatever areas you're looking for is to just do a search for right whale sightings. And that should bring up this map. And again, it's interactive. So you can set whatever dates, you can look at whatever areas you'd like to. And this does cover the entire coast. So here's a map of all of the sightings so far for 2020 that span from Canadian waters down to Florida and even into the Gulf of Mexico, which doesn't always happen. So it is kind of neat to be able to look at this on a broader scale as well. So this is a really important resource that you can use. Another important thing to do before you actually head out on the water is to test your VHF radio. And this is actually a good tip to do regardless of why you're heading out on the water. It is important to make sure that you have a way to communicate with the Coast Guard and with other vessels nearby. But in the context of how it's important when you're watching whales, we'll get to that in a little bit. Now, again, I'm talking a lot about resources that are here in the Northeast region along the US Atlantic coast, but we do have some apps and other resources that are available that would apply more to other areas. So on our website, csbout.org, slash dive deeper. That's basically our list of resources where we'll point you to some other um, helpful resources and apps like what you're seeing here on the screen for different, different regions. All right, so 
the morning of or the day of, you're getting ready to head out on the water, what do you pack? Well, if you're used to heading out on the water, you might already have your own list anyway of things that you typically bring. But I figured I'd kind of walk you through the list of things that we usually pack when we're heading out on a well watch. One of the more helpful things is a set of binoculars. So here's one of our former interns, Becca, using a pair of binoculars out on the water. And this is important for a number of reasons, but mainly because you can start to look for whales from a pretty far distance. And so especially if it's a really clear day, you might actually be able to see whales up ahead a couple miles away. So if you have binoculars handy, that's gonna help you see a little bit further and get a jump on when you might be entering an area where you'll find some whales. A couple of other things, our lovely staff member, Sabrina, here modeling two helpful things for us. You may have caught some of Sabrina's previous live streams. She has sunglasses on, and we are definitely big fans of polarized sunglasses. And again, if you're used to being on the water, you may already have a pair, but it's definitely really helpful when you're looking for whales because the polarized lenses will kind of cut through the water a little bit and you can sometimes even see the whales before they break the surface. So particularly this is helpful when you are closer to whales so that you can make sure that you're keeping a safe distance and you know where the whale is about to come up. The other thing she has in her hand is a camera and in particular, a pretty good lens on that camera. And I know this isn't available to everybody, but if you do have a, a zoom lens for your camera, it's definitely helpful to bring that because if you are following the whale watching guidelines, you're not always getting super close to the whales. So I know we all take our cell phones with us wherever we go these days, and you can still get really great pictures on your cell phones. But if you're looking for higher quality pictures or closer pictures, rather than get dangerously close to the whales, it's better to have a zoom lens on your camera. So definitely bring that if you have one. Sunscreen, again, Probably good for anyone who's going out on the boat, but in particular, if you're out looking for whales, it can take a while to find them sometimes, again, depending on where you are and where the whales are. And you're also likely to spend more time outside instead of in a wheelhouse or in a cabin, because if you're out on an open deck, you get a better range of visibility. So sometimes you really need to scan the entire distance of the water when you're looking for whales. So if you're like me and you have light skin, we're looking at a minimum of an SPF 30, uh, but definitely bring sunscreen and make sure you reapply throughout the day. Layers are always helpful. So we are often out for quite a while. You can, if you leave in the morning, it might still be a little bit cooler. It's always colder on the water, on the water than on land. So our team is a big fan of bringing layers that you can take on and off throughout the day. Um, this happens to be one of my favorite TV shows. If anybody else gets the reference here, please put it in the comments. I want to know where my fellow fans are. And patience. Make sure you bring some patience. I know it's easier said than done, but you are going into the whale's habitat and you're watching the whales doing what they happen to be doing. And so sometimes that means they're diving for 20 minutes at a time. And it is a test of your patience. So try to be patient as much as possible. We're really only seeing the whales for roughly like 10% of their life. They spend most of their time down below and then we're fortunate to see them when they come to the surface. So definitely bring your patience. And to go along with that, snacks, super important. Our team loves to bring a variety of snacks on our trips. So it's important to keep that nourishment going. And of course, also water. I don't have a picture of that here, but plenty of water to drink as well. All right, so you've packed everything you need to pack. You're heading underway. What do you look for at this point? So when you're trying to find whales, there's a couple of different things that you can look for. And some of it may depend on the type of whale that you're seeing. But here we have a couple of those main indicators to look for, and those are backs, slows, bubbles, and fluke prints. So we're just gonna quickly break down each one of these. Backs, so you're actually seeing the whale's back. So that means that obviously there's a whale right in front of you at the surface. On a nice sunny day, you can probably see a little bit of glare. It'll look like there's something shiny. Uh, because of the sleek back of the whale, there's a little bit of reflection from the sun. 
So this, obviously you're gonna know that there's a whale there, but sometimes it's actually kind of hard to see their backs. So this is quite a different weather day and it's a little bit cloudy. There are whales visible in this picture, but I'm curious for those of you that are watching, if you can let me know in the comments how many whales you think are in this picture, how many you think you can see. So sometimes it can be really hard to see whales, even if they're not too far off from you. In a situation like this, these whales are definitely hard to see. So it is important to make sure that you're paying attention and keeping your, keeping your eyes on the water as much as possible. Um, so there are two whales here in this picture and hopefully you can see my mouse because I didn't put circles on these, but there's one over here and another one over here. So we have two whales just kind of resting here near the surface of the water. This is actually a behavior that we call logging where the whales are basically as close to sleeping um, as they can be. And so they're not moving very much. They're just kind of resting at the surface. So again, really sometimes hard to see them. So it is important to make sure you're keeping a close eye. The second one blows. So this is the whale's exhale. And if you've caught any of our previous live streams, you'll know that whales are mammals and they do in fact breathe air. So what you're seeing here is a spout of air vapor. And especially on a calm day, you can actually see this from a couple miles away. And in particular, if you have a set of binoculars with you. So this is a whale that has just come up to the surface for a breath. It's likely that the whale will remain there for at least another couple of seconds, if not a couple of minutes. But whales can also hold their breath for a really long time. So if they come up to the surface, they'll either take a couple of quick breaths and then head back down, or they might hang out for a little bit. But either way, you'll know that there is a whale just ahead of you if you're seeing that. Bubbles. So not all species blow bubbles, but some do. And again, in our area here off the coast of New England, we have a lot of um, plant-like organisms in the water. So that's why when you're looking at this, it might look kind of green. And so if a whale is blowing bubbles in this area, a lot of times it will look green. So, but you can see this disturbance from a good distance usually. And this is an indication that a whale is about to come up to the surface to feed on some fish. And so a couple of other indicators, you may be able to look down into the water and actually see some of those schooled fish. So frantically trying to get away from the bubbles that the whale just blew. So there's, I don't know how well it comes through on the, the stream, but on the bottom right corner there, we have a picture of sand lance, which are a main type of prey in this area. And then there's also usually a lot of birds around when you have whales feeding because those birds are trying to eat the same fish that the whales are. So on the picture on the bottom left, the whale has just come up to take a big mouthful of fish and there's a whole bunch of birds surrounding it trying to come in and just take what they can from the whale's efforts. So bubbles, birds, and fish are all associated with some whales feeding. So you'll definitely wanna make sure that you're being careful in this scenario because their behavior can be a little bit sporadic when they're trying to catch their food. Fluke prints. So this is a flat patch on the surface of the water. And this means that a whale just dove down. And so whales move their tails up and down, unlike fish who move their tails side to side. And when they do move their tails up and down like that, it creates this calm flat patch. And so this doesn't always mean that a whale dove down far below the surface. They could actually still be nearby, um, but we tend to see a bigger fluke print when a whale is going down for a dive because they're pumping their tails a little bit more. So this will be an indication most times that a whale was just there, but it's not necessarily where the whale still is because that fluke print is created from their movement. So they're actively moving forward as you're seeing those fluke prints. All right, so now we've covered what to look for. We're gonna segue into what to do when you actually see a whale, when you wanna get closer, when you wanna take a look. So the first thing is to start to slow down. And again, you can think of it like if you're traveling, heading up into a school or some other public place where you know that there's a lot of people, you have a lot of crosswalks, you have slower speed limits there. And that's just to make sure that everybody has a chance to get where they need to safely. Same thing on the water, when you're starting to approach a whale, you probably don't know what it's doing and you probably 
won't be able to figure out right away what kind of whale it is. So it's safest to slow down to about 10 knots, and that gives you a chance to enter the whale slowly, get a better handle on what you're seeing, what's out there, how many whales there are, what they're doing. So once you get closer, you'll actually wanna to come to a complete stop when you're actually able to. But as from the time that you first see a whale, as you're starting to get a little bit closer, just drop your speed to about 10 knots. So in this area, um, the New England Mid-Atlantic area, it's recommended to stay 100 feet away from a whale. And so I don't know about you guys, I am terrible at estimating distance, especially on the water. So this can be kind of challenging, but I like to think of it in terms of boat lengths. So if we take an example that we used earlier of our 31 foot boat, and if you multiply that by four, you're at about 124 feet. So that's probably a safe bet to aim for is about four boat lengths for this size boat. So again, if you're anything like me, I tend to underestimate. So if you overestimate to four boat lengths, chances are you'll probably be around 100 feet. So this is a good practice um, if you want to practice on land. Sometimes that's helpful, but it definitely is a little bit different on the water. But try to think about boat lengths and you can do the simple math for whatever size boat you may have. Now, the 100 foot distance is a guideline in place for this region. It does vary in other areas. And even in our area for all US waters, you do have to say 1500 feet or 500 yards away from North Atlantic right whales. So I didn't do the math here for that, for our 31 foot boat, boat. I will let you guys do that or for whatever size boat you do have. But again, this, this will vary by region for some species and some areas. So definitely important to check out your local region for NOAA fisheries and look into what their guidelines are. As the whale is moving through the water and you're starting to stay close by and you wanna take another look, the best thing that you can do is parallel the whale's course. So in this picture on the right side, we have a whale probably feeding, I would guess in this picture, I think we're seeing the, the whale's face or mouth and it's coming directly towards us. And so the boat over on the left side is also pointing directly towards us. This is great. So they're both moving in the same direction, parallel lines, and this will obviously prevent them from crossing paths. Now, again, these whales are wild creatures. They will go wherever they wanna go and do whatever they wanna do. So at some point in time, this whale will change its direction. And at that point, it's best for the person driving the boat to do the same. So try as much as you possibly can to parallel the course of the whale. That will prevent you from coming to a T intersection or from you coming straight towards the whale. That would make the whale have to change its path or you have to change your path. So just best to parallel the course of the whale. Now, Weekends in particular can be a little bit crowded as people are off from work. So it's possible that when you get out to an area where you're seeing whales that you wanna take a closer look at, that there might be other boats out there. And so one of our friendly tips for the Sea of Spout program is if there's lots of boats, talk to folks. So this is the first place where your VHF radio will come in handy. So you wanna communicate with the other boats that are around you and just try to figure out where everybody's going, how you can coordinate your viewing of a particular whale or a group of whales. You definitely don't want to surround a whale and force them to feel trapped. So obviously they can always dive down below, but again, we don't wanna impact any of their natural behaviors because that's actually considered harassment um, under federal laws that protect these whales. So anything that we're doing out on the water, we wanna make sure it's not disrupting the whale's natural behavior. So in a situation like this, it's best to just pick up your VHF radio and try to connect with the other boats that are around you. And you'll see in this picture, there's a, a variety of different boats here. One of them I think is a whale watching boat. So they're obviously most likely out there to watch whales. The other boats might not be watching whales, but if they are right in that immediate area, it's still important to connect with them and just figure out where they're planning to move to next so that you can maneuver safely around the whale, but also around the other boats. All right, another tip is to drop your sails if you're on a sailboat. 
Now, we have a whole separate program specifically for sailors called Sharing the Seas. And so we can definitely provide more details on that for anyone who might have a sailboat and is interested in learning more. But we've been, uh, it's been kind of surprising that people um, don't necessarily think about this. So if you're under sail, it can be a little bit challenging to quickly turn away. So if a whale just happened to pop up directly in front of your boat, again, they can hold their breath for a really long time. So if a whale was just down for 20 minutes and decided to come up right in front of you, you'd have no way of knowing that that whale was there. And so if you're under sail, you can't quite stop or maneuver as quickly as you could if you were using your auxiliary engine. So that's always our recommendation. And again, you might be entering a, an area where you have no idea that there are whales around, in which case you just kind of have to do the best that you can to maneuver safely. But once you know that you're in an area where you think there might be whales around, whenever possible, it is best to take your sails down and use your auxiliary engine. Now, there are also things that you can do to help protect the whales that you're seeing out there and other marine life as well. So any boaters that are out on the water also have an opportunity to play an important role in whale conservation. So researchers often don't have all of the funding that they need to be able to carry out the surveys that would be really helpful. So people that are out there every day on their own boats can be a really important resource and contributor to these important sightings. So three main things in particular that I wanted to bring up is the reporting of injured whales, dead whales, and entangled whales. And I know I should have given a warning, this isn't the most positive slide, um, but it is again really important to bring up because not everybody knows that, that their report can actually be really, really helpful. So if you're out on the water and you think that you've seen any one of these situations, you can always just pick up your VHF radio and hail the Coast Guard on channel 16. That's probably the easiest thing to do. But again, depending on your region, there are NOAA fisheries reporting hotlines where you can leave a message 24 seven about what you're seeing and where you are. So the picture on the left here is a whale that's entangled in some green netting. Um, this is a minke whale, I believe. And so it has the netting wrapped around its mouth. So that's definitely gonna be a challenging situation for that whale. If you're seeing a dead whale, it is still important for researchers to know about that. So there may be whales that they've been tracking recently that were in poor health. And so they may be able to connect um, a dead whale that's seen in a particular area to a whale that they might've been tracking. Even if that's not the case, all of these whales are protected by federal law. And that involves keeping an eye on their population estimates. So some of these whales are also endangered. So it's especially important for those populations. But either way, it's really important to make sure that this information gets communicated to those folks who are maintaining those databases, just so we can keep an accurate population count. And then if you're seeing a whale that's injured, that's also really important. It all kind of goes into that same database as I was just talking about where we're able to maintain populations and account for these injuries and try to figure out if we can, where they're happening and why they're happening. So if you're seeing any of this, it's definitely important to share that information if you can. All of the regional hotline numbers are on our website at csbout.org. So um, definitely take a look at that. It's also really helpful to have those phone numbers saved in your phone before you head out on the water so that if you do have cell phone service, you can call that number directly. But again, you can always hail the Coast Guard on channel 16. And in addition to that, we do wanna know about all North Atlantic right whale sightings. So if you've been with me from the start of this live stream, um, you may recognize this map from earlier. This is that sightings reporting system that anybody can access online. And you can actually contribute sightings to this. So the whale tails that you're seeing here that indicate sightings reports, some of them came from research uh, surveys, but some of them also came from the average citizen. So anyone who's out on the water can submit a sighting. You'll wanna to try to log as much information as you can in terms of the time, the location, how many whales there were, and just as much detail as you can if you can figure out in which direction the whales are heading, that's also helpful. And 
all of this is being said in the context of being able to identify a right whale, which is kind of the first step. So again, I talked about the importance of being able to recognize different species. So this is an illustration of what a North Atlantic right whale looks like. It has no dorsal fin and it does have a V-shaped flow or spout. So especially on a calm day and from the right angle, if you're seeing an exhale from a whale that goes into a V-shape, it's probably gonna be a right whale. So the first thing you wanna do is maintain a 500 yard or 1500 foot distance and start to write as much information as you can. If you can get pictures or video, that's also super helpful as well. I have two different hotline numbers here for the different regions in the US. So these wells are only found in the Atlantic. We have two regional offices for NOAA fisheries in the Atlantic. And so these are the hotline numbers to reach either of those. I'm pretty sure you can call either one, even if it's the wrong one, um, they communicate with each other and they can forward your, your sighting. And again, you always have that fail safe of reporting it to the Coast Guard on your VHF radio. But definitely super important. Again, these whales are endangered. There's only about 400 individuals left in the population. So we really wanna to try to track them as much as we can. And if you're seeing a whale out there, your report can also help other boaters that might be in that area to be able to keep an eye out and also know that there is a whale in the area. So going back to safety, you're potentially keeping not only the whale safe, but, but other boats in the area as well. And I keep talking about the approach distance. So for right whales, again, it's 1500 feet, 500 yards. And realistically, this is what a right whale would look like from that distance. So again, helpful to have binoculars on board because from that distance, a right whale skim feeding at the surface, like you're seeing here, just the very top of the whale's head kind of just looks like a rock, um, which is unfortunate. And I hate talking like that about them, but it's true. I've seen it. And in this picture, it doesn't look like a whole lot more than a rock, but it is in fact a right whale, a super important sighting. But keeping that distance, you won't really be able to see too much of the whale. So keep in mind that you're not gonna get a very close up look. If a right whale does come closer to you than that, the best thing to do is depart at a slow, safe speed as soon as you can, but making sure that you know where the whale is before you move at all at that point. So again, this is for all right whales, whether they are perfectly healthy or entangled or injured, they wanna know about it. So I know I've covered a lot and um, I'm gonna go to the questions here in a, or go to the comments here in a minute to see if there are any questions. If you have a question and you haven't submitted it yet, now would be the time to do that. But if you're feeling overwhelmed by all of the information that I gave you, you do have the option to go out on the water with people who are trained annually on all of this information and a whole lot more. So WDC also co-runs a program called Whale Sense, which is voluntary and free for whale watching companies to participate in. And so what you're seeing on the screen here are the regions where our, the Whale Sense program is offered. So in the Atlantic, all the states across the top there, and then in the Alaska region um, in those different cities. So all of these operators and naturalists that work for participating whale sense companies are trained on all of this information. So if you don't wanna worry about doing all of that work and you wanna go out with a trained professional, definitely check out whalesense.org. Unfortunately, right now with the COVID-19 precautions, a lot of the companies are not currently able to run. Um, I know right now our participating companies in New Jersey are up and running. And I believe in Virginia, they may have just started as well other regions to be determined. We can definitely keep every, everybody posted on that. But you do have that option as well. Either way, if you're heading out on the water, I hope that you've learned a thing or two today. And um, I am gonna go over to the comments now just to see if there are any questions. All right, so the first question, how can you start a job like this? Great question. I can tell you how I started, and that was as an intern. So I did go to school for marine science, and I carried out an internship with WDC. That was 11 years ago. And so I volunteered for a couple of years with them and was one of the fortunate few that was able to find employment with them. 
um, us. <laughs> it's weird to talk about it in past tense and present tense. We are a small office, so it doesn't happen too often that we're able to recruit um, and hire volunteers, but it is a good networking opportunity, whether you're interning with WDC or any other marine conservation groups. We work in partnership with a lot of different groups. And so you get to meet a lot of, a lot of different people and just learn more about the opportunities that are out there and the work that's being done. So I highly recommend looking into that if you're interested in this type of work. Karen says, we found a pilot whale dead on our beach in Mexico this morning. That is really sad. And I think we'll probably follow up with you in the comments to learn a little bit more about that. But, uh, any word on the humpback that washed up on Long Island last weekend? So the full answer is I don't know. Last I heard they had carried out a necropsy, but I think it usually takes a little bit for some of those test results to come back. I would imagine right now that some labs are also overwhelmed with all of the COVID-19 testing. So there could be a little bit of a delay um, and I, I won't make any speculations beyond what I saw online already, um, but we can definitely try to keep you updated on that. So again, I, I don't know actually who was the first to document that, that humpback that washed up on Long Island, but that's the kind of thing where a lot of times those reports actually come from boaters that are out on the water and are the first ones to, to lay eyes on on those whales. So all of those reports that come in are super helpful. So just another plea to keep that in mind for anyone who's heading out. All right, well, I don't see any other questions or comments. Hopefully I didn't miss any, but if I did, we will follow up in the text of the chat to answer those for you. So thank you everybody for watching with me. Um, we have another live stream coming up on Thursday talking about whale superlatives. So we'll highlight some of our, our record holders within the whale world. And then we have a lot of exciting content coming up for the month of June, which is Orca Action Month. So definitely stay tuned to our Facebook for more details on all of that. And um, any suggestions that you guys have for things that you'd like to see from us, we're always open to those suggestions. So feel free to, to put those in the comments as well. But in the meantime, I hope that you enjoy the rest of your week the rest of the month and that everybody is staying safe out there um, in everyday life and also on the water. And go ahead and check out seaspout.org for any more details on the information that I shared with you today. All right, thank you everybody. Have a great day.